Okay, so we are on the very last video tutorial for computational archaeology this semester, and we're finishing up with our imagery analysis. This is the third practicum, the final practicum for final uh, for project four, and so we're in the project four uh, description file again, and basically we're going to cover part three. This is a little bit tricky. I, but there's not a lot of steps. You just have to repeat them multiple times. And I've taken the trouble to write these instructions out in pretty good detail here. But we're going to go through this in the video, basically covering everything that you see here. And the goal is to get an unsupervised classification of your sentinel imagery. So first things first, here we are still back in uh, where we basically left off last time. Um, let me just remove this. Uh, actually, I'll leave this here because we still have our NDVI and we can include the NDVI in this if we want to as well. So the deal is that remember when we uh, when we bring in multiband imagery into GRASS, it separates out each band and uh, creates an individual raster file for each of the bands. And here you have 2, 3, 4, 8, 8A, 11, and 12 of a Sentinel-2 image covering Calabria, this part of Calabria. Um, these are the ones I chose to import for you. Again, there's more Sentinel bands out there. And if you have good reason to use some of those additional bands, you certainly could use them in this. But these are the ones that we brought in. And remember, those ones are all over in permanent. And in our false color map set, we have NDVI in our color composite. So the first thing probably we want to do is to go to our data tab and actually create a new map set to work in. Remember, we usually want to organize each phase of our work in a new map set. So I'm going to call this unsupervised classification, just so I know what I was doing in here. So that makes some sense. And we are now in there. And so we'll switch back, or you know, we'll switch our uh, grass working environment map set access. We want to make sure we check the false color because we're going to want to grab that NDVI image eventually. So the first thing is we got all those bands. They're separated. Grass, you know, other than the name, grass doesn't really know that they belong to one stack, you know, a multi-band image. So we have to create what's called an imagery group to tell grass when we do our image processing that all of these uh, individual files are part of one multi-band image that we want to work with. And again, it's up to us to define what we include. Now, if we want to include derivative products like NDVI, or hey, even elevation or slope, or whatever else, artifact density, we could certainly do that here. So all these tools are going to be under the imagery uh, file menu. And to create the group, we're going to use uh, develop images and group, create edit group. The uh, grass ID shortcut is i.group. It's a little bit funny to see at the beginning, uh, but what we want to do is to give this a new name. We'll call this Sentinel2. And the first thing we're going to do is hit this Add button right here. And it will bring up this little uh, subsidiary dialog that says Add Selected uh, Map Layers into the group, which is going to be called Sentinel2. We are currently in our current map set on supervised classification, but we need to change to permanent which is where we see all of our bands. Now, if we wanted to filter this, if we had a ton of, we could use wildcard filtering here uh, to select them sort of automatically. And as we do that, you'll see it gets rid of any other raster file that doesn't have this little prefix here. There wasn't so many so that, you know, if we didn't want to do that, we could certainly click them manually if we wanted to. But, you know, just since Typically, your imagery files are going to be imported all with the same prefix. You know, at least that's how you download them from uh, the, the um, whatever website you're getting them from. It makes it really easy to automatically select them all. And so there they are. And we want to add our NDVI. So let's go back into Add. And after we do that, hit False Color to get to the False Color map set. That's where our NDVI is saved. We'll just check that, and we'll click OK. And now we see that the NDVI is in there. So we're going to need to create a subgroup. But first thing we want to do is to create this first. So we'll just hit Apply. It says, do you want to apply the changes? Click OK. 
once this is done, this is now an existing group and we can edit a subgroup inside of there. And this is in case you don't want to use all the bands, including, you know, including the NDVI, you can create subsets within the group so that you can be more specific. So you can make one big group with all the bands and then you can make individual subsets, for example, just the visual, just the infrared, or in our case, that's going to be all or all plus NDVI. So we'll put all bands and then uh, we'll select all but uncheck that and we'll hit apply and then we'll put all bands plus NDVI and we're going to select all and just make sure even the NDVI is checked here and we'll hit apply and you know what while we're here we'll just put just visible because why not you know since we're in here in case we want to work with something that's just the visible and then we'll check two three four we'll hit apply so now we're done so now we have these uh, imagery groups which are saved in our uh, particular map set and when we need to find them there'll be little dialogues that allow us to find them so to do the unsupervised classification we are going to go back to imagery and we're going to go to the thing that says classify image. Now in here we have a uh, clustering input for unsupervised classification. That's the first tool we'll need, i.cluster. And then we actually need the classifier and we're going to use this maximum likelihood classification, i.maxlike. So we're going to need to use these sort of in tandem going back and forth. Just for your information's sake, if you wanted to do supervised classification, the easiest one is to use this g.gui.i class, which uh, apparently has uh, broken my grass. Uh, so let me just start up grass again. Uh, in which case, you'd be able to draw the little bounding boxes around the different training areas for different clusters. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do that because it's a little bit involved uh, in terms of where we're where we really want to be. So. Let me uh, make sure I'm in the right place. There we are. And back into unsupervised classification. Okay. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, add in our false color image from here so we can get back to where we were at. Okay, so there we are and let's set our um, set computational region to match that so we're good to go at this particular point. And the good thing about grass is even when it crashes everything is saved that you did. Um, the only real bummer is that you'd have to reset your layers unless you saved uh, some sort of um, grass workspace file, which I never do, <laughs> um, which would get you started a little bit faster. But we're basically ready to go back uh, into this. So let's get our classified tools up again. I cluster on the left, and uh, we're going to get IMAX like on the right. Okay. So uh, let me just widen these up a little bit and I'll show you how they basically work. So Essentially what we're going to do is use iCluster to generate the signature file, the spectral signature file across the input bands that we want to work with. And then we will use iMaxLike to classify based on that spectral signature. So the first thing we're going to do is start an iCluster and it's going to want the name of the input imagery group. And here we have our Sentinel-2. And then here's where we can pick our subgroup. I'm just going to start with all the bands plus NDVI because why not start big and then narrow down if we have to. And here we're going to put our new signature file and uh, we're going to want to give this a, um, a descriptive name because we might want to have multiple signature files. So I'm just going to call this one, um, let's say I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with 10 classes. So I'm going to call this SIG 10 classes all bands, right, uh, and NDVI. 
so I can remember exactly what this is. You don't want to start with a number, so always start with letters. Remember using your underscores, all the same stuff applies to the naming conventions. So once that's set up here, again, I already set this to the number of classes that I think I, I want to see in here. I'm just guessing at the beginning, 10. Um, you can give a specific sample size because it's not going to look at the whole image. It's only going to look at some proportion of it. The default is, I think, 10% uh, or something of it. Um, you, know, you can read in the manual exactly what it is. So I just usually use the default unless I have a good reason to up the sample size. Uh, 30 iterations, uh, let's just leave it like that to see how that goes. I might have to make it bigger. And uh, percent convergence means how, what's the stopping rule? Like how, uh, you know, how tight will our cluster be? I'll leave it at 98. If you go up to 99, you might want to do that to get a slightly more discrete uh, overlap or, you know, convergence at this point. And then cluster separation is that magic number that I mentioned in class where it's image specific and you're going to want to increase it. I'll start with one and then see what that I mean, what that does. This is the minimum number of pixels for a class. So if you have a, a very specific class where it's very small and you want to get rid of that, you would just put whatever number of pixels you need to here. I usually just leave it alone to begin with unless I have a very good reason to get rid of one small class out of my results. And uh, at this point, we also want to put an output file to contain the report. Without this, you will have no information to interpret what your clusters actually are. So I'm just going to put this in my home folder, and I'm going to put this as um, uh, report one, 10 class, all bands, and DVI. Again, you want it to be. Uh, descriptive so that you know what it is and you probably want to put .txt because it's just a text file so you know depending on your operating system Linux will find it even if it doesn't have that but it, your Windows or Mac might not be able to open it unless you put .txt and then you just hit run and it does it creates a signature file now we can go back to, or we can go over to max like we pick our input imagery group our input uh, subgroup which was all bands plus NDVI and we should uh, be able to find our what did we call it we can just copy this if it's if it's not showing up in there it should be in there and here is our uh, output map so we'll just give it the same name to begin with uh, but take off the sig part of it um, and of course we can't start with the number so it will be classes 10 all bands and DVI and uh, we, if you want you can re pick the rejection map but I typically don't usually look at that so it's up to you again reading the manual file and we'll hit run and here we go this is our classified map over here so what we we'll want to do is to add a legend for that and uh, it will tell us the colors one two three four five six again i think it's using the veritas color scheme if we want to we can right click on it and set the color table to something you know so this is the one right here something a little bit more interesting um like one of this bgyr and it might help us to differentiate the clusters a little bit easier in this particular case um, but in order to figure out what these are, what you need to do is, uh, I mentioned, yeah, come on, get bigger. Uh, I mentioned in class, you want to probably zoom in to some of these areas. And so here we have cluster five and six, and you might want to just sort of pop back and forth. And I'm seeing the yellow here, which is cluster four, looks like the gravels, the alluvial gravels, and bare earth on top of the mountain over here. And uh, by the way, you'll notice it only found six clusters. Um, so either uh, we only have six clusters, or our algorithms that we use need to be tuned a little bit. So, you know, that's the first sort of visual. Then also we have to go to our um, our 
uh, browser, file browser, there it is, and go to our report right here, which is our text file. And so it basically shows you all this, you know, the bands that were put into it, the region and all of that, how many clusters I asked it to do, and all the input values, the convergence, the class separation, etc. And it gives you means and standard deviations. And here it gives you the means for each of the input, uh, initial means for each of the inputs. And then as it iterates, it changes the means for the different classes uh, as you go forward until it reaches its convergence. And you can basically follow through. And at the end, you get all the different uh, classes and the means across the bands, two, three, four, eight, eight A, 11, 12, and NDVI, right? And you basically can use this information to see, you know, which band is contributing more to, uh, to each cluster, okay? So again, reading the manual, is going to be very helpful for iCluster and it'll help you interpret exactly what that signature is and exactly how it goes about figuring it out. It's pretty useful, so definitely read through this over here. Now, what I'll try and do here, real quick, uh, is to show you how you're going to go back and forth between this. Uh, let's go to the settings, let's increase cluster separation to five, uh, increase convergence to 99. And uh, just make sure we allow overwrite and hit run. And then we go back over here and everything should be the same of you know input files and we'll allow overwrite and we'll hit run. And at this point we've, we've got some thresholds. We've gotten rid of a couple classes. So we probably went a little too far. So we can reduce this, let's say 97 and go back to like two or something like that. We can hit run, and we can hit run again when that's done. And basically what we can see now is we only have five classes. So okay, interesting. Let's keep it at 97, but go up again to five. Again, these are kind of like trial and error. And once that's done, okay, so it's the 97 is really what's driving this, this result over here. So let's go to 98.5 and see what that does. So again, you're going kind of back and forth. And again, so we have some rejections over here, but we got up to, actually we got up to seven classes and we need to apply our color map again. Uh, so if we pick that, uh, this again, hit run. There we go. So we have our seven classes now. So you can basically see how that's going. Um, we might want to hit verbose module output here, in which case it will tell you how many, uh, how many iterations. And in this case, 30 might not be enough, so we'll increase it to 100, and we'll hit run. And we got to 69, right? So that allows us to ensure that we're doing the right number. Uh-oh, we got too much cluster separation, so we'll go back. We'll hit run, and in fact, we might not even be able to do that. So let's just put zero and see what happens here. It finished in 15. Okay, so we're back to 10 classes at that particular moment. And again, let's go up a notch to 0.5. In that case, it did, I don't think it did anything different. And again, you know, if we have our colors still up here, we want to just hit run on that so that we get all the colors in here. So um, it found 10, but it only ran for 15 iterations. So that suggests to me that we needed to increase this. Let's try increasing this. So that's probably not enough either. Yeah, it looks like we got a little bit of refinement here, but we probably want to increase this to like 0.75. 
and that's probably not enough either. So again, you kind of want to just keep pushing that number up until it crosses the limit. Oops, hit run. Okay, so now we got to 81, and we'll see what it does over here. Okay, so we just crossed the limit for that. So let's go back to, let's just try 0 0.85 now. Because that will give us the best results, and it looks like 85 is too far. Oh, no, maybe that was it. Yeah, nine clusters. So we basically found our little sweet spot. We could maybe fine tune it just a little bit more. But I think this is probably the best result for us. We told it we thought there was 10 things by tweaking our, our uh, percent convergence to 99 and our cluster separation to 0.85. We got nine probably pretty good things. And we could even increase this to like 99.5. But if you get close to 100, it will become pretty much impossible for the thing to do it. But Let's just see if we go up just a little bit. It will just refine the areas a little bit more, so that might be useful. So again, you know, to interpret what these are, you got to go back and forth. And I'm even seeing shadows <laughs> of the mountains being classified here. So maybe it's uh, a little bit too tight, and we want to loosen things up, reducing the number of classes. And again, do that here. And if we do that, we're going to want to change our name so we don't want to have the 10 classes anymore, right, for all the stuff. And of course, maybe we don't want to input in DVI, so we can go in and just do all bands or just visible. So I would encourage you to go through a couple different combinations of this until you get to a classification scheme that seems meaningful to you, looking at the visual patterns, but also, again, looking at the text file for the, for the report to figure out what is actually going into each of these. So that's basically it. Um, that's the last practicum. And hopefully this all kind of will stay in your quiver. And again, these videos are available on YouTube. So even a year from now or whatever, you can come back. And uh, if you miss the sound of my voice, you can come back and watch these videos again and remind yourself all about GIS, computational archaeology, imagery analysis, etc. All right. Hope that helps. Take care.